Did Frank convince his lynchers? During the 170-mile journey to his own lynching, it has been claimed, Leo Frank, quote, asserted his innocence so persuasively, end quote, that several of his abductors were convinced that they had the wrong man. Among those trafficking in the false claim was Frank's own attorney, Louis Marshall, and author Melissa Fay Green adds, quote, one refused to go on with it and urged that Frank be returned to the prison, end quote. Leonard Dinnerstein tells a similar tale that Frank had, quote, convinced, end quote, his lynchers that, quote, he really had not murdered Mary Fagan, end quote. Steve Oney wrote in 1985 that, quote, a tense debate broke out. After several sharp exchanges, the faction advocating mercy was overruled, end quote. But Oney drops that dramatic claim in his 2003 book, And the Dead Shall Rise, making no mention of it in his chapter-long account of the lynching. Harry Golden said that during his last hours, Frank said nothing. Thomas E. Watson openly advocated for Frank's, quote, irregular execution, end quote, and would probably have had the best inside sources to gain knowledge of the actions of the lynchers. He says that, quote, twice in the seven-hour automobile ride of 170 miles, end quote, Frank, quote, was asked if he killed Mary Fagan. He did not answer. Not once, in all that long ride to death, did he protest his innocence. End quote. All evidence refutes the claims that Leo Frank argued on his own behalf in his final ride to Fray's Gin. The only words Frank is believed to have said during that fateful night were his request that his wedding ring be returned to his wife. Frank's lynchers actually granted and honored Frank's last request, which was carried out immediately and respectfully by his murderers. Lost Files and Non-Existent Teeth Marks Dutch journalist Pierre van Passen claimed that in 1922 he had gained access to documents, x-rays, and photos, not presented at trial, that indicated Mary Fagan had been bitten on her left shoulder and neck before being strangled. In the lengthy medical testimony, there is nothing that refers to any evidence of bite or teeth marks on the victim. Van Passen concluded, however, that, quote, photos of the teeth marks on her body did not correspond with Leo Frank's set of teeth of which several photos were included, end quote. He provided no details of how he could have made this determination, and no subsequent writer, historian, attorney, medical examiner, dentist, or investigator of any kind has made any similar claims. But Van Passen's efforts are noteworthy because of the resistance he claims to have encountered when gathering this, quote, information, end quote. He says he was thwarted by Frank's Jewish attorney, Henry A. Alexander. Quote, he said, The Jewish community in its entirety still felt nervous about the incident. If I wrote the articles, old resentments might be stirred up, and who knows— some of the unknown lynchers might recognize themselves as participants in my description of the lynching. It was better, Mr. Alexander thought, to leave sleeping lions alone. Some local rabbis were drawn into the discussion, and they actually pleaded, to stop me from reviving interest in the Frank case, as this was bound to have evil repercussions on the Jewish community. End quote. Van Passen further implied that his attempts to gather information from Frank's supporters resulted in a late-night attempt on his own life. Quote, that someone had blabbed out of school became quite evident when I received a printed warning saying, Lay off the Frank case if you want to keep healthy. The unsigned warning was reinforced one night, or rather early one morning when I was driving home. A large automobile drove up alongside of me and forced me into the track of a fast-moving streetcar coming from the opposite direction. My car was demolished, but I escaped without a scratch. End quote. When, in more recent times, Harvard attorney Alan Dershowitz attempted to obtain that, quote, evidence, end quote, he found that Alexander's Jewish partner, Max Goldstein, had, quote, destroyed, end quote, the file. A file that one must then assume implicated Leo Frank in, not cleared him of, 
The Murder of Mary Fagan Alonzo Mann and the Leo Frank Pardon Quote, You can't reverse an 80-year-old conviction based on the wavering memory of an 85-year-old man. End quote. Steve Oney in 1915, Governor John Slayton of Georgia would not deploy the power of his office to pardon Leo Frank, even though he claimed to be convinced of his innocence. He chose to commute Frank's sentence from death to life imprisonment, both being legally appropriate sentences for first-degree murder. It took 68 years from the time of Slayton's official action before the friends and supporters of the Leo Frank legend reappeared to finish the task in seeking a full pardon for their man. Their first attempt in 1983 was denied by the Georgia State Board of Pardons and Paroles, but in 1985, the Jewish community began working secretly with the board to prepare what it called a, quote, posthumous pardon, end quote, of Leo Frank. The five-member board allowed no other testimony or input from the family of Mary Fagan, James Conley, Hugh Dorsey, or any other interested party. And on March 11, 1986, the body announced its unprecedented action to the public. Quote, Without attempting to address the question of guilt or innocence, and in recognition of the state's failure to protect the person of Leo M. Frank, and thereby preserve his opportunity for continued legal appeal of his conviction, and in recognition of the state's failure to bring his killers to justice, and as an effort to heal old wounds, the State Board of Pardons and Paroles, in compliance with its constitutional and statutory authority, hereby grants to Leo M. Frank a pardon. End quote. The board's action was certainly unprecedented, and possibly illegal, given that the first pardon attempt just three years earlier was rejected explicitly because of a lack of evidence. Quote, For the board to grant such a pardon, the innocence of the subject must be shown conclusively. In the board's opinion, this has not been shown. End quote. In effect, the Board of Pardons and Paroles flouted its own mandate and ignored its own criteria in order to reverse its decision without establishing Frank's innocence. Indeed, the pardon has to do with actions or inactions of the state of Georgia and does not acknowledge any crime for which a pardon is necessary. Further, according to Georgia statutes, it is not clear that a dead, convicted felon who has not served out his sentence can be pardoned. The entire episode provides yet another example of the raw force wielded by Jewish organizations to achieve a symbolic redemption for one of their own. Alonzo Mann Pardons Leo Frank It is the first failed attempt to exonerate Leo Frank in 1982 that provides a significant new chapter in the analysis of the 1913 murder of Mary Fagan. Charles Wittenstein, Southern Counsel for the Anti-Defamation League, ADL, and attorney Dale M. Schwartz, an ADL national board member, spearheaded the campaign and claimed to have found new explosive evidence that finally, quote, solved, end quote, the murder of Mary Fagan. That, quote, evidence, end quote, appeared in the person of 83-year-old Alonzo Lonnie Mann, who, as a 13-year-old boy, worked at the National Pencil Company factory on the day of the murder as Frank's assistant, quote, office boy, end quote. Mann had reemerged after 69 years of total silence to reveal a remarkable secret that his conscience had finally demanded he hold no longer. He was now claiming that on April 26, 1913, the day of the murder of Mary Fagan, he had entered the factory and surprised James Conley carrying the girl's body at the foot of the first floor stairway. Mann said that Conley saw him and threatened his life if he ever told anyone what he had seen. Mann went home and told his parents, who swore him to secrecy about his experience. In fact, Alonzo Mann, who died in 1985, kept his experience quiet long after his parents had died, but with his own death approaching, he finally wanted to set the record straight and make his story known. Alonzo Mann's astonishing revelation was featured in Nashville's Tennessean newspaper, 
which on March 7, 1982, devoted an entire Sunday section to Man's Tale, titled, quote, An Innocent Man Was Lynched, end quote. In its multi-article spread, Alonzo Mann's story was presented as the final resolution, the be-all and end-all, the smoking gun of the Mary Fagan murder case. The Tennessean's team of crack journalists, led by Jerry Thompson and Robert Sherborne, and its publisher, John Siegenthaler, were assisted by the state librarian and a polygraph technician. And with this single Sunday issue, the Tennessean set about to accomplish what all of Leo Frank's lawyers, Adolph Ox's New York Times, and William J. Burns's detectives could not. The exoneration of, quote, the Jew, end quote, Leo Frank, and the conviction of, quote, the real killer, end quote, quote, the Negro, end quote, James Conley. But despite the Tennessean's pretense of skilled and balanced journalism, there are serious flaws in its promotion and handling of the Alonzo Mann story that call into question the newspaper's very credibility. And it starts with the Tennessean building the false impression that Mann's story had been legally tested, when in fact Mann was never questioned or challenged in any judicial forum. For example, the paper refers to Mann's passing a, quote, lie detector, end quote, test and a photo depicts man strapped to a polygraph machine, but there is no known recording or transcript of that examination or test results available for scholars to analyze independently. All other documents related to the, quote, pardon, end quote, are for some unknown reason considered a, quote, confidential state secret, end quote. And, quote, not subject to release under the Open Records Act. End quote. During the frenzied publicity tour that surrounded the Tennessean spread, Mann gave interviews in which he claimed to know Conley's motive and the intimate details of his life. Steve Oney quoted Mann thus, quote, I know why he, end quote, Conley, quote, had the girl, too. He wanted her money. Jim Conley was a smart negra. He could talk to you, and he had a personality you would like. But he drank all the time. And he had women in there. He was drinking that morning. End quote. Tennessean reporters did not ask Mann how he could have known the details of Conley's character and factory practices. For the boy had just been hired April 1, 1913, and only worked two Saturdays before the murder. Yet he spoke of Conley as if the two had had a long-term intimate association. And the more Alonzo Mann talked about his 69-year-old experience, the less it could be synchronized with the known facts of the case, and, indeed, with his own previous versions of the story. Steve Oney, deemed an, quote, expert, end quote, on the case by the Anti-Defamation League, had to conclude that Mann's, quote, confession, end quote, was, quote, incredibly dramatic, end quote, but, quote, added little of probative value. End quote. Alonzo Mann's Unbelievable Beliefs A closer look at Mann's new testimony justifies Oni's polite rebuff. After many decades of rumination over his role in the episode, the elderly man seems to have conflated his own 1913 memories with the many published accounts of the Leo Frank affair to create, in 1982, an impossible scenario. To start, in 1913, Mann testified under oath that, quote, he did not know Mary Fagan even by sight, end quote. By 1982, Mann was telling a tale of having seen Mary at the factory riding in a little red wagon and laughing along with another girl employee. Nearly 70 years later, he now was claiming to have known her both by name and by sight. In his 1982, quote, affidavit, end quote, Mann makes the following statement about his appearance at the trial. Quote, I was nervous and afraid that day. There were crowds in the street who were angry and who were saying that Leo Frank should die. Some were yelling things like, kill the Jew, end quote. Though this, quote, kill the Jew, end quote, statement has been published many times, in 
the claim has been thoroughly debunked and has now been quietly dropped from all the latest, quote, pro-Frank, end quote, accounts of the trial, including Oni's, quote, official, end quote, 2003 book, the Atlanta Brayman Museum's 2008 Leo Frank exhibit, and the 2009 ADL-endorsed PBS docudrama, The People vs. Leo Frank. Yet the 83-year-old Alonzo Mann clearly believed that he had experienced the utterances firsthand. A few months after his reemergence, Mann was asked by his own attorney, John J. Hooker, to reiterate that experience, and Mann added quite a bit more to the tale. Quote, When I went to the courthouse, there was at least 500 people in the street, and they were saying to each other, Kill the Jew. Kill the Jew. Some had pistols. Some had knives. They were crazy. End quote. The brandishing of weapons is an embellishment that is unique to man's account. Even Frank's lawyers, in all their many appeals, never claimed weapons to be part of the proceedings, and never claimed threats were uttered or expressed. Anti-Defamation League attorney Dale Schwartz quotes his client, quote, Lonnie Mann said he was scared to death. People had guns in their back pockets. And when he got in there, Jim Conley was sitting at a table or something and gave him, as he put it, the evil eye and stared him down. End quote. Conley was not in the courtroom during Mann's testimony on August 12th. Conley had appeared in court the previous week for his own testimony and was returned to his cell at the Fulton County Jail. So the alleged, quote, stare down, end quote, is another invention of either Mann or his attorney. Mann said he, quote, did not remember, end quote, seeing Wade Campbell, Corinthia Hall, Emma Freeman, Lemmy Quinn, or Mrs. Arthur White, all of whom were present at the factory office on April 26, 1913, the day of the murder. Yet he claims to have seen Conley three separate times, twice more than any other witness. When Mann arrived at 8 o'clock a.m., he says he saw Conley, quote, sitting under the stairwell on the first floor of the building, end quote. And later, when Mann left, quote, just before noon, end quote, he saw Conley, quote, sitting where I had seen him when I came to work, in the darkened area of the stairwell, end quote. And yet a third time, when he returned to, quote, catch, end quote, Conley carrying the body of Mary Fagan. In 1982, Alonzo Mann described his first interaction with Conley on that Saturday. Quote, He spoke to me. He asked me for a dime to buy a beer. A dime could buy a good-sized beer in those days. I told Jim Conley I didn't have a dime. That was not the truth. I had some money in my pocket, but I had let Conley have a nickel or a dime for beer before. He never paid me back. I didn't like to be around Jim Conley. After I told Conley I didn't have any money, I went up the stairs to the second floor where my desk was located in the office of Leo Frank. End quote. Mann somehow remembers that at that early hour, Conley, quote, had obviously already consumed considerable beer. End quote. But the specific testimony of one factory visitor named E. K. Graham, who saw Conley, was that, quote, if he was drunk, I couldn't notice it, end quote. And Graham's sighting would have been four hours further into the alleged drinking binge. Ivy Jones saw Conley on that day between one and two o'clock, and he swore, quote, he was not drunk when I saw him, end quote. Mann's new claim that Conley, quote, had women in there, end quote, is a brand new revelation that has never been suggested by any other witness, not even by the factory's longtime employees or by his employer, Leo Frank. Mann's disdain for Conley's alleged misbehavior is not shared by the young white women who worked alongside Conley far longer than did Mann. They should have been scared to death of the, quote, vulgar and slovenly Negro sweeper, end quote. But Assistant Superintendent Herbert Schiff testified under oath that, quote, Conley was in the chain gang two or three times. Once he worked on Forsyth Street in front of the building, and then women would come up to me and try to get money to get him out, two or three times. 
That has happened since he has been working at the factory. End quote. This is an extraordinary testament to the character of the black man that Mann and Frank's advocates insisted was universally disliked and feared. These young white women who were willing to approach their own employer to seek funds to redeem Conley from a prison chain gang to return him to work with them at the factory. It is the third time Mann saw Conley that is the most troublesome. Mann says he came through the unlocked front door of the factory shortly after noon and spied Conley carrying Mary Fagan's dead or unconscious body. He further speculates, quote, From the direction, end quote, Conley, quote, was headed, and the attitude of the body, that he was preparing to dump Mary Fagan down the trap door, end quote which was at floor level and approximately five feet from where Frank's advocates allege the murder occurred. The Tennessean provides an illustration of Conley carrying the body over his right shoulder whilst prying open the hatchway with his left foot, an eyeing man who looks on from behind. If this were the case, one must ask why Conley had lifted the body at all. Lifting 125 pounds of dead weight would be unnecessary for the stated task. And this makes Alonzo Mann's, quote, vision, end quote, highly suspect. Even a drunk man would know that dragging an unwieldy load is far, far easier than lifting it, especially when the intention is to move a body to a hole on the same floor just five feet away, with no intervening obstacles. Of course, one of the first clues the police detected was the visible drag mark on the basement floor that led from the elevator to the location of the body about 30 feet away. Star Witness For the prosecution? Mann makes competing claims that conflict with Frank's longtime theory of the murder. Frank says that Conley laid in wait on the first floor for Mary Fagan to descend the stairs, after receiving her payment in Frank's second-floor office. Mann is very clear in his signed Tennessean affidavit of March 1982 about the location of this horrible crime. Quote, I am convinced that, end quote, Mary Fagan, quote, had left the pay window and was coming down the stairs or had reached the first floor when she met Conley, end quote. But just a few months later, Mann is far less sure of that first-floor murder theory. Quote, I never thought too much about that. He could have brought her down the steps because he was a strong Negro. He must have brought her down the steps. I never thought too much about that part. End quote. This, of course, is exactly what Frank's supporters did not want to hear Mann say. For if Conley were coming from upstairs with the body of Mary Fagan, then he was coming from the presence of Leo Frank, who had just paid Mary in his office. Those who insist that Conley committed the murder have a very small window for their theory to have any merit at all, and it absolutely requires that the assault be as far away from Leo Frank as possible. Any violent scuffle ending in murder could never have occurred on the second floor, just outside Frank's office, without his clear knowledge or participation. The autopsy revealed that Mary's death was a violent affair that left her with a blackened eye and a gash on the back of her head, with the ultimate cause of her death being strangulation, a lengthy process entailing much struggle, choking, and flailing by the victim. Yet, they claim a drunken Conley accomplished the gruesome task noiselessly, presumably in a ninja-like fashion. So when Alonzo Mann, the only living witness to the actions on that day, theorizes that Conley, quote, must have brought her down the steps, end quote, he essentially explodes the murdered on the first floor theory and actually does more than any previous witness to implicate Leo Frank as the murderer. One can only imagine the glee of prosecutors had young Alonzo testified to this in 1913. Mann further falters when he describes Conley's relationship with Frank in precisely the way prosecutors portrayed it. Quote, Mr. Frank just gave him orders and he carried them out. End quote. Further verification comes from ADL attorney Dale Schwartz, who confirms and reiterates Mann's account in Howard Simon's book 
Jewish Times. Quote, Lonnie Mann saw Jim Conley carrying the limp body down the steps and into the main part of the factory, walking toward the chute to the basement. End quote. Last, the Frank defense actually advanced a theory of the crime that, yet again, is incompatible with Mann's claims. They say that Conley confronted Fagan on the first floor and pushed her to the rear hallway and murdered her there, not in the front vestibule. They say he then threw her down the back steps to the basement and followed later to strangle her and finish her off. The defense's scenario, graphically presented in the August 12, 1913, issue of the Atlanta Georgian, is totally inconsistent with what Alonzo Mann now says he witnessed as he came through the factory's front entrance. Man Overboard The Downfall of a Savior A coalition of Jewish organizations, including the Anti-Defamation League, the American Jewish Committee, and the Atlanta Jewish Federation, arranged for Mann to tell his story in a question-and-answer session that was taped and transcribed on November 10, 1982, in Atlanta in the presence of two members of the Georgia State Board of Pardons and Paroles. It was not a hearing in any legal sense. There was no swearing-in or questioning by adversaries. Instead, the session was arranged with the stated purpose to, quote, preserve for all time the testimony of Alonzo Mann, end quote but a review of the transcript reveals several problematic components of the session that undermine Mann's new claims. First, Mann says he was moved to come forward after reading about 30 pages of Harry Golden's book on the case, A Little Girl is Dead. Quote, I saw there were so many mistakes in there and so many things that wasn't true, end quote, he says contemptuously. But Golden's book is an unashamedly pro-Frank book, and Frank partisans swear by its accuracy. Golden's first 30 pages, and the next 350 pages for that matter, are true to the standard pro-Frank narrative, and, even so, Mann offers nothing to correct those, quote, so many mistakes, end quote. Mann attempts to explain away his withholding of evidence in 1913 that might have saved Frank's life with the very dubious claim that the police did not ask him, quote, any direct questions about anything important, except what I did. No one asked me anything in regards to that, end quote. Not only is that answer patently untrue, the police had no other purpose in communicating with him except to ask him about the murder, which occurred in a place where he had been only moments before. And, as will be shown, investigators interviewed Mann several times about his knowledge of Mary's murder, but Mann withheld evidence, even committing perjury, a serious felony. As stated, Mann testified at the trial of Leo Frank on August 12, 1913, but provided no useful information about the murder. When asked about that in his 1982 session, his answer is indeed strange. Quote, At that time, that was all I knew. I told it all. End quote. Mann claims that Conley threatened to kill him and that frightened him into silence for 69 years. But in his 1982 retelling of his alleged encounter with Conley, he says that immediately after Conley's death threat, quote, I took a couple of steps up. And I saw the door was locked or shut. And I didn't go on up. So I turned around and went out the door and went home. End quote. This is an extremely odd reaction by a person who had just come upon a murder scene, with the murderer in the process of murdering. And the, quote, locked or shut, end quote, door is altogether new and contradicts all his previous claims. A few minutes later, Mann's attorney reminds him that he once told a far more explicit story, and then reads to Mann his previously sworn affidavit. Quote, I turned and took a step or two, possibly three or four steps, up towards the second floor. But I must have worried about whether the office upstairs was closed. I did hear some movement upstairs, but I can't be sure who was on the floors above. I, end quote, was, quote, 
fearful that the office might be closed, so I turned back towards Conley. I wanted to get out of there quick. He got to within about eight feet of me. He reached out as if to put one arm or hand on me. I ran out of the front door and raced away from the building. End quote. The witness confirms, quote, that is correct. End quote. Mann clearly had lost an incredible amount of detail in a matter of a few months, details that must be read to him for him to recall. The attorney questioning Mann, John J. Hooker, is unable to elicit responses from Mann that synchronize with the affidavit. Hooker then takes over the session, providing both questions and answers on Mann's behalf. He simply reads Mann's previous affidavit, quote, testimony, end quote, and then asks him to confirm its veracity. Still, man betrays a faulty memory. Quote, Hooker. He could have dumped her down the empty elevator shaft. Man. No, he couldn't have if the elevator shaft wasn't... Hooker. End quote. Cutting man off in mid-sentence. Quote, I understand, but the affidavit said he could have dumped her down the elevator shaft. End quote. Man answers, quote, no, end quote. But the attorney, John J. Hooker, insists that man should answer in the affirmative. Attorney Hooker is obsessed with establishing the drunkenness of Conley and leads man into a discussion of that, including this odd exchange where man resists committing to Hooker's leading question. Quote, Hooker. Was he often drunk on the job? Man. He was smart. He had a lot of sense, but it was the wrong kind of sense. End quote. Man seems to have forgotten the conversation he says he had with Conley about his borrowing money for beer. He said in March 1982 that he had seen Conley, quote, under the steps, end quote, and, quote, obviously, end quote, drinking. When asked directly in November 1982, quote, did you have a conversation with him? End quote. Man responded, quote, No, I just walked right on. End quote. The session arranged by the Jewish groups was designed to showcase for the Georgia State Board of Pardons and Paroles their conclusive new evidence proving Leo Frank's innocence. But Alonzo Mann's faulty, erratic, unstable memory produced the opposite effect. The two members of the board who were present, of the five-member board, could only have been convinced that Alonzo Mann did not help Frank's supporters sustain their burden of proof. The board's refusal to grant a posthumous pardon to Leo Frank was inescapable. Be with us again next time when we present the next chapter of The Secret Relationship Between Blacks and Jews, Volume 3. The Leo Frank Case the lynching of a guilty man. Prepared by the Historical Research Department of the Nation of Islam, Chicago, Illinois. Copyright 2016 by Latimer Associates. All rights reserved. Published in audiobook form by the American Mercury with permission of the Historical Research Department of the Nation of Islam. Of the Nation of Islam. Of the Nation of Islam. Of